Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Howard Tan, uh, Neighborhood Development Officer. Um, we would like to um, put all of your questions, uh, have questions in the chat. We will have uh, team members who will um, retrieve those questions out of the chat and um, present them to our um, presenters for hopefully um, an answer. On behalf of Baltimore City Department of Housing and Community Development, Receivership process uh, workshop store for you. But before we get into the elves, um, oh, there she is. Okay, like to introduce yourself, please. Uh, unmute Kate, please. Kate Edwards, if you can unmute her, Daniel. You're unmuted. Kate. Daniel, I think you unmuted me, not Kate. The other Kate. Kate, Kate, Kate Edwards, I'm sorry, Kate Edwards. Kate Edwards. <laughs> Um, there she is. Now, right? okay. We can't hear you, Kate. You can't hear me? Can you hear me? No? Yes, barely. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Oh, barely. Let me take out the headphones. That didn't help? That's better. That's better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kate Edwards. I am the Assistant Commissioner for Land Transactions and Management in the Development Division here at DHCD. So, I mean, thanks everybody for joining us. Looks like we got a great turnout, and I am excited about this presentation. I think it's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Danielle, if you could unmute um, the other Danielle Reynolds and Development Info and Nikki. Okay. Um, okay. Who is Nikki? Okay. Hi, I'm Kelly Bakla. I'm the neighborhood development officer for Northwest, uh, Park Heights uh, area mostly, but um, all of the Northwest. I'm sorry. Hello, Major. Nikki. I Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I know the reception is a little bit bad on this uh, WebEx. Um, hopefully, we'll get that together. But um, I am the neighborhood development officer for the Baltimore region. All right. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Lee. I am the neighborhood development officer for the Northeast region, which is basically the Greenmount corridor going all the way up past Morgan um, to the county line. So it's the whole central Baltimore corridor, uh, the Waverly's and York Road corridor, so on and so forth. Top neighborhood officer for um, Smore, which is uh, the central part of Baltimore. I'm going west, Harlem Park, Sand Town, and uh, Montgomery. And, um, we have a colleague who will be on a little later, Robin Ayelli. She handles Southwest Baltimore, and that encompasses the um, Southwest Partnership area um, going west as well. Our director, who is not on the call, uh, Teresa Stevens, she is our um, director of neighborhood development and outreach. Again, uh, again, we thank you all for coming out, and um, 
Danielle, if you can, um, I don't know where that sound is coming from. But at this time, I would like to introduce our presenters. Uh, first up we have is uh, Katie Byrne. Katie Byrne is the Assistant Commissioner for Litigation with the Code Enforcement Legal Section Division of the Department of Housing and Community Development for Baltimore City. For the past 20 years, Katie has worked both private practice and in government, focusing her practice on code enforcement, environmental and land use law, and district court litigation. Currently, Katie manages a team of 10 lawyers, eight paralegals who file more than a thousand cases, both civil and criminal per year in Baltimore City District Court, enforcing Baltimore City's building, fire, and related codes, as well as zoning codes, environmental laws, and public nuisance laws. Additionally, she supervises the Division Special Investigation Unit that consists of a Chief of Investigations and 12 investigators assigned to investigate complaints and violations of environmental and housing code laws. And they file criminal and it is the pretty red as well as in the city's green building laws and as part of the impl implementation team for the Baltimore City's zoning code. Pia Heslip, she is the executive director of One House at a Time Incorporated, a nonprofit that serves as a court appointed receiver of vacant properties in Baltimore City. Previously, she was the director of development and energy programs at Healthy Neighborhoods Incorporated, where she developed Healthy Neighborhoods Energy Retrofit Grant Program, which funded energy efficiency upgrades in facilities owned and operated by nonprofit organizations serving low to moderate income populations. During her tenure at H9, Ms. Heslip raised nearly $8 million in grants for community development and energy projects in Baltimore City. She joined HNI as a compliance officer overseeing the rehabilitation of single family homes funded by the Federal Neighborhood Stabilization Program 2, also known as NSP2. Before moving to Baltimore, she was a program officer at Chicago Network, a nonprofit coalition operations and housing advocacy groups, where she managed research and capacity initiatives to its members. Ms. Hester graduated from Rutgers University history and completed graduate courses in historic preservation at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. At this time, I'd like to uh, present our two presenters, Katie Byrne and Pia Hesley. Katie. Thank you, Howard. Uh, we, P and I are going to work together tonight. We've got a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to share my screen with everyone and we will work together off of the PowerPoint. All right. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Thumbs up. All right. Awesome. So yep. let's start the slideshow. Okay, so this is a presentation that we've put together on vacant building receivership. Um, this is something that we've been doing every so often, uh, one house at a time, also with code enforcement legal getting together so that we can educate you guys on exactly what receivership is and what receivership is not. So we've got a vacant building problem in Baltimore, if you didn't know that already. We have, um, back in 1950 was probably the city's max population. It was about a million people. We've since lost three to 400,000 of those million people. So we're down to 600,000. And um, they didn't take their houses with them, right? So we still have a lot of empty houses in Baltimore. The 
we have approximately it's actually this number has dropped i just got numbers an hour ago so our vacant buildings in baltimore city the exact number is 15,792 of those there are of the 50, almost 16,000, only 1,376 are owned by the Marin City Council, 231 are owned by HABC. So the bulk of the vacants in Baltimore are owned by private citizens. We have concentrated, about 10,000 of the 16,000 vacants are in concentrated area, and about 6,000 of them are scattered through other locations in the city. We have different strategies to try to deal with the vacant building problem. One includes demolition. The problem with demolition is that we're a city of row homes. It costs anywhere from 10,000 to 70,000 to demolish a structure. So it's, it's not the most cost effective way to deal with vacant buildings. We are still doing it. We are still demolishing properties, but again, it's really tied to the funding that we have. We had traditional code enforcement tools, including injunctions, citations, and criminal penalties. We still use those to try to tackle some vacant buildings, but receivership has been a, an awesome tool for us in order to combat vacant buildings. So what to do with the problem, right? We've got dead property owners. We've got properties that are upside down with mortgages that have crazy tax liens on them, and they're all privately owned or the majority of them are privately owned. So we have a vacant building receiver statute, and this is found in the Baltimore City Building Fire and Related Codes. And essentially what it says is that if we have an unsafe structure, meaning one that has an actual vacant building notice on it, the building official may petition the court for the appointment of a receiver to sell the property so that it's rehabilitated by a qualified buyer. Right? So this is a process that the city doesn't take title, but it's considered a nuisance abatement tool. So receiverships can, for the most part, quickly address and remedy a nuisance property. So nuisance property, as something that's vacant, is defined as something that's a nuisance per se. So really what that means is once that vacant building notice gets attached to that property, it's deemed a nuisance. It's deemed a hazard. And that's what gives the city the authority to move forward and try to abate or get rid of this nuisance through the court action. We use a lot of different strategies to tackle vacants and we use tools to continue to track and monitor. So we look at um, different markets we look where development is happening and sometimes we'll move to an area where it might be distressed because there's been some interest so someone has said i will be your bidder of last resort and says that i have the money i've got the funding i've pre-qualified with one house at a time nobody else wants to buy this property but i will buy this property receivership only works when there's a buyer on the back end so we have almost 16,000 vacant buildings in the city. Receivership is not the tool for every single one of them, right? We are strategic in what we file, when we file, and where we file. And it's a court process. So remember, every single one of these properties is owned individually. And that means that we have to file suit against that individual owner. And then we have to identify anybody that has a legal interest in that property. So a bank, um, somebody with a tax sale certificate, any judgment creditor, all of these lien holders are notified. And then who gets appointed? What the statute says is the receiver is appointed to sell, demolish, or rehabilitate. We don't do the rehabilitation thing here. Um, it's really time consuming, it's burdensome. But the majority of the time, the receiver is appointed to sell the property to someone who can renovate it. So with that said, we've had cases where we filed in court and the mortgage company has come in and said, I'll be the receiver, I will renovate the property, and then I will foreclose on my lien. So there are instances where the property owner um, 
you know, loses out to maybe another lien holder and that lien holder could be appointed. But for the most part, when we go through the process, we have a receiver, a third party appointed by the court to sell the property to abate the nuisance. So receivership can transfer or rehabilitate the property, right? But we transfer it at a public, it goes to the court appoints the receiver. It's a public auction to a pre-qualified bidder. You just can't walk up to an auction and say, I'm here to bid. You have to be determined by the receiver that you have the ability to abate the nuisance and spring pre-qualified. Um, it is rare, 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 super rare that a private sale can happen via the receiver because all parties have to agree to the price and the price has to be fair market value. And as you can imagine, most defendants in a receivership action never agree to price. So this is something that I, it's never happened. Let's put it that way. Um, so rehabilitate to abate the nuisance. So the contract, the person who signs the contract, right, or borrows money using the receiver lien, they have to manage the property after rehabilitation for after two years, applying rent, foreclose on the receiver's lien. This is that receiver um, for rehabilitation piece that we don't generally do here. Banks might be able to step in and do this, but we've never appointed a receiver to rehabilitate. Property owners can avoid the appointment of a vacant building receiver. When a property owner shows up in court, the court will give them the opportunity to prove that they can abate the nuisance, meaning get rid of the vacant building notice on their own. They have to present that they have the funding, that they have the ability, and then they have to present a timetable, right? So the money, the means, and an end date. All three of those things are required, and we enter into agreements with the court signs off on these court orders for the owner to rehabilitate or demolish the structure by a set period of time. Sometimes the owners have to post a bond, sometimes they don't. If they fail to achieve the terms of that order, we go back into court, we argue it again, and we ask that the receiver be appointed. But just because a property is in receivership and in litigation doesn't mean it's gonna end up with the receiver and end up being an auction it means that the owner still has the opportunity to abate the vacant building notice. I see there's a couple questions coming up in the chat. Um, if I think we can, do you want to, Danielle, do you want to wait to the end or do you want me to? Yeah, let's, let's wait to the end. Let's wait to the end. Okay. We'll wait to the end. All right. Sounds good. All right, so receivership is specifically not a governmental taking. So what I hear all the time is that the city's trying to take my house. The city is, is you know, taking my house and not paying me for it. That's not where receivership is. Receivership is a valid exercise of governmental power to abate a nuisance. It's something super important for everybody to understand. The city never gets a deed to these properties. We never record a deed. We never take title. It will never say owned by Marin City Council when it goes through a receivership action. It goes, we sue because the building is vacant. The receiver sells it to someone because the building is vacant. The whole reason why we get to go to receivership and sell this vacant building is because at the end of the day, the purchaser has to make it better. They have to get rid of this nuisance and that nuisance is the vacant building notice. If the property is demolished prior to the appointment of the receiver, that land doesn't get transferred by the receiver. Why? It's the structure that's the problem, right? So it's a nuisance abatement tool. It's not an action where the city takes title. All right, so it supports neighborhood, uh, strengthens communities. We also... Um, we look at, let me see, um, we try to abate the you know vacant buildings, you get rid of trash, you helpfully get rid of, of graffiti. And it's not only just for residential properties, receivership or pot can apply to any property that has a vacant building notice. We also auction off, or we get the receiver appointed to auction off commercial properties both large and small. It could be a large multifamily, small multifamily, a large warehouse like this. It could be 
um, something that has a mixed use development, it doesn't matter. It's the vacant building notice that drives when we can file the receivership action. It's just an example of a before and after that was a receivership action. And another one. So you see where we have the demolition here. The owner, the purchaser bought this through receivership auction when it had the vacant building structures on it. If the city had demolished these structures, it would have cost us about $120,000 to $150,000. And that lien would have been placed on the property. And then that vacant land could potentially end up going to tax sale. It would have been encumbered for a really long time. But with receivership, we sold the vacant buildings. We, we basically, the whole property was able to transfer vacant buildings on it. And then the buyer is the one who abated the nuisance by demolishing the structure. We look at different neighborhoods. So under the old vacancy to value, and we still use this terminology, there was something called streamlined code enforcement. And it's where you have a property that but for something, it shouldn't be vacant. So this is what I talk about the market driver, right? So this property had fallen into disrepair. You have dead property owners. You have people that are upside down on a mortgage or say they didn't have insurance on the property. There was a fire, they're forced to abandon it, but then title kind of still stays there. But for one of these situations, it wouldn't be vacant. So it makes complete sense for receivership to step in file the petition, have the receiver auction it at its true market value in order to turn it around. So even though there's, say, someone that hasn't stepped up and said, I'm interested in this property, I have the money, I have the means, because we know it's in a, a market that will assume this, we will go ahead and file receivership on those. Here's an example of one where we had, I think, four or five properties all in a row that were damaged. One was fire damaged on the inside. Sometimes these are really, really difficult. And so you'll see if you go into code map, you'll see where we file receiverships in certain blocks or rows. It doesn't mean all five of these were going to come out. And one, we had a defunct church and another one where the fire occurred, it had a, they, there was the owner was in bankruptcy, right? So again, each one of these we have to file because they're individual owners. All five might come out to a receivership auction. Only two might come out to a receivership auction. One might come out after 12 months. Another one might not come out until two years based on what that court and litigation property could be. So if we're talking about um, clustered in neighborhoods, neighborhoods where we might not necessarily have um, you know, that are struggling, but where there's someone who said that they will be able to rehabilitate, we will look at particular properties that there wouldn't necessarily be a market for, but for someone stepping up and say, I've got the money, I've got the means, I'm interested. Code map. So for all you guys out there, code map is a huge, huge tool for you to use. If you go to DHCD's website, DHCD Baltimore City, on the very front page, it has interactive maps. I encourage every single one of you to click on code map and just spend some quality time with it. It identifies areas that we're filing receiverships in. It'll identify vacant buildings for you. It identifies the city owned properties as well. It will kind of help you figure out what's going on with where we're active and where we're not. So this is this was an estimated time frame if all things go well with receivership. All right. So things I want you guys to consider. This is this is pre-COVID. All right. So I'm going to get into a little bit about what has happened in the last few months with litigation and receivership as well. So if a case comes up to our office, um, an attorney in the district will make a determination as to whether or not they think it's viable for receivership. We have to order title. Title comes in, say 120 days um, to 100 and sometimes 160 days, depending on what the court's doing for us to file this action in court and for us to get that action served. And then possibly 160 to 190 days before it would go to auction. Then you've got another 60 days for the court to ratify the sale. Then, then after that, it really depends on the buyer and it depends on when the liens can be released. So from day one, it can take um, six months, nine months, 12 months, right? So I try to tell people from the day we file, 
give it 12 months to when you're going to get title. And that's if all things work out in your favor. Like I said, when we looked at those five, each one of those had their own independent path. If we get in, if we get the appointment quickly, we can get it to auction quickly. We get the sale ratified. That's on the court. And then the time from ratification to settlement, a lot of it depends on who your title company is, depends on if there's any additional issues that we run into at the back end. But for the most part, after the sale is ratified, um, it's on um, your title company in order to process that and then the city to release the liens. So talking a little bit about COVID right now, we had not we have not been able to file any new receivership cases since March 13, 14, 15, right in and out and then there. We just got the clear from the district court to go ahead and start filing two weeks ago. So we have not filed any new cases in months. Um, and the cases that we are filing, because we're limited on the number of people we can have in court, we're limited to the number of cases we that can be heard in court. So it's a slow return. Just to give you an idea, the number of cases we would hear on a weekly basis, it was anywhere between 75 and 120 a week. We are down to 30 cases a week. So it's 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 slow and steady right now, um, depending on how things go with COVID, depending on what the court does. We may be able to gear up, but we also may have to gear down. So just want that to be realistic for everybody where we are right now as far as timeline for litigation and new cases. On average, we file 500 receiverships a year. That will not happen in 2020, obviously, with the, with only one third of the year active for filing. Um, since 2012, we filed more than 4,500 receivership cases. Since 2019, over 5 million in total sales. And since 2011, over 2,500 use and occupancy permits have been issued from the time that a case was referred to legal. So it's, it's a great, great tool for getting use and occupancies. Something I want to, to communicate is though, you are not guaranteed to be the winning bidder at a receivership auction. So if you're working with us, if you bought some city properties in a particular block and you wanna buy the private owns at a receivership auction, it's, it's still a litigation process. It still requires that the court um, has told the receiver that they must sell the property to the highest bidder. It doesn't mean, you know, it's if, if you want, if you're buying it for your family, if you're the neighbor next door, if you're the developer that wants to put homeowners in it and not renters in there, that doesn't matter because the judicial sale rules specifically say it must be sold to the highest bidder. So at this point, I'm going to turn over the um, presentation to Pia to talk about one house at a time's role. Danielle, can you unmute, unmute Pia, please? Can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that, Pia. It's okay. okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, my name is Pia Heslip, and I am the executive director of One House at a Time. Uh, please bear with me because I, I started at one house at a time in February, mid-February, and um, so this is my first rodeo. So I know Kat, Katie has been doing this for a while. And um, so, um, yeah, so I started in, in February and then a month later we shut down and, and everything that I've learned at training went out the window. So I'm kind of um, also going to be talking about some of the changes on our end um, related to um, uh, COVID and, and how we're adjusting to that. Um, so uh, one house at a time, uh, as we mentioned before, it's a, we're a nonprofit that streamlines the transfer of Baltimore City vacant properties to qualified rehabbers. Um, the court actually, um, Katie mentions that we are uh, we are appointed the receiver, but um, the city does not appoint us. The court appoints us as vacant building receiver. So that's an important thing to note. Um, currently, one house at a time is the only receiver qualified by the district court to be appointed as the receiver for city vacants. So that means that uh, we answer to the district court. So that they um, everything is governed by the, that process. 
Um, next slide, Katie. Okay, hold on. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it's not going down. Hold on one second. Okay. Oops. Oops. There you go. There we go. Now so, it's rolling. There we go. Okay. So what does the court order? Um, the receiver, us, we must uh, transfer the property to an entity that will abate that nuisance through uh, renovation or demo. Most of the time is renovation. Um, we do this through public auction um, to qual pre-qualified bidders. A public auction means that we follow the rules regarding notice. Um, advertising um, must be open and, and fair, um, and we sell the property to the highest bidder. Um, we have no uh, control over which properties come in. We receive them. We don't. We are a neutral third party, so we. Do not influence the outcomes of the property, you know, who it goes to, how it's going to be used. And also, um, we don't, we're not the ones who put the properties into the auction that comes from the city. So that's another important thing to note. Um, to become a pre qualified bidder with one house, you must demonstrate the ability to and expertise to rehab the property within a year. Um, and I'll talk about that more. I'll expand upon those requirements in a little bit. Um, next slide. Um, here's in a nutshell what we do, um, what One House does. Um, we pre qualify bidders, um, conduct auctions, um, we submit all the filings to the court, um, work to clear title and uh, schedule settlement. Um, once that occurs, we distribute proceeds. Um, prepare and file the final accounting to the court and um, also um, ask the court to terminate the receivership um, once um, we've um, once everything's been completed. Um, next slide. Okay. What is expected of a receivership buyer? Um, so I've only been here uh, less than a year, but I think the first expectation we have is that you have to be communicative and responsive to us. So um, I think, you know, uh, COVID times have changed a little bit, but um, we prefer not to chase after people um, when we're trying to schedule settlement or get some information to move forward. Um, so that's, that's uh, one thing we expect of a receivership buyer. Another thing is that um, once the buyer takes title to the property, um, you must abate that vacant building notice within a year. Um, and also an, another expectation is that you read your contracts. Next slide. Okay. Um, taking properties to auction. Um, once the city has um, placed a property in receivership and the 30 day appeal period has passed, um, we begin the process of preparing the property for auction. So that means, as mentioned, we set an auction date, we post it on our website, we do all the legal, um, we place the legal advertising. We also secure the properties. And if uh, the properties are safe to enter, we'll place a combo lock um, so that uh, any interested buyer um, can look at the property. Um, as much as we try to show the state of each property um, through photos, um, I think it's, it's, it's um, highly recommended that you visit a property before buying, before um, looking to purchase um, to get a full picture of what you're getting. Um, next slide, Katie. Okay, how to qualify to bid. Um, so most receivership properties are in very poor condition. And um, I would say that this is not a program for first time rehabbers. Um, we do get inquiries um, from folks who want to get a buy a vacant as their first, as their home, their rehab it and it'll, it'll be the first home and they have no experience rehabbing. Um, we require experienced individuals and companies to um, uh, who can obtain a UNO within that time frame, and um, also be able to handle, you know, the difficulty of of uh, rehabbing a vacant property. Many of them been they've been vacant for decades. So, um, 
you'll see here, um, we have a very short application. So let me pull up one page. You'll find it on our website. Um, we will do our best to help you uh, work through the application. We certainly want more bidders, so um, we, we're happy to assist you with that. And we'll, um, you could submit it uh, over email, mail, fax, and um, Jane Siebold, who is our program coordinator, she's very, she's very good and she will um, help you work through any details or any missing documentation that she needs. Um, next slide, Katie. Um, as far as documentation goes, um, you must be able to show that you have the financial ability to um, complete a rehab. So that means you must show a minimum of $90,000 in liquid assets to complete acquisition and necessary uh, renovations. You must show that you have um, experience um, rehabbing similar properties. You must be in good standing as a property owner in Baltimore City. That means that you don't have other properties with BBNs. You don't have violations in all the other properties you own. And mo most importantly, that you don't have another property in receivership. So, um, and I'll add to that's in there. You also must be in good standing with the state of Maryland. Um, one house will uh, will review applications and we will approve applicants to bid. Um, and based on how assets that you show, um, if you are a new bidder with us, we will approve you up for up to five properties, um, depending on how your assets. And once you've shown um, a track record of completing UNOs on time and um, producing with us, then we'll be able to um, increase your um, Cap for how many properties you can bid on at any one time, um, in, um, depending on the assets that you show. Um, again, you can find our application forms at our website at onehousebaltimore.org. I'm sure um, you'll all have a, you'll you'll get this PowerPoint information there. Um, next slide, Katie. Okay, finding properties for auction. Um, so about four to five weeks before an auction, we will send out a preview list of addresses to our mailing list. So if you're not on our mailing list, if you'd like to be, you can go to our website and sign up. Um, as soon as we have photographs, we'll post them on our website. Our auctioneer is AJ Billick. They will also post it on their website and you can also get on their mailing list and they um, do, do uh, frequent um, email blasts um, with upcoming auctions. Um, I placed a picture in here because this is a kind of, this is what a, um, what it looks at at AJ Billig's website. Um, Katie, I'll go back to this picture later, um, when we get to the, um, auction process or auction day. Um, okay. yeah, next slide is, uh, the auction process. So. Normally, we have auctions every two months and we hold them at the Delta Hotels by Maria at Cross Keys, but we're not doing that um, for the time being. And um, we've moved our gallery auctions online. So the bidder applications and deadlines are the same, um, but we do have some extra steps for each bidder in order to participate. Um, so the online process is still being conducted by AJ Billig. They have a platform, an online platform and a mobile app. Um, you can find that on their website. Um, qualified bidders um, must register for online auction. So that means just simply sending us an email um, with your intent to participate and then sending us a copy of a government issued ID too, and um, you will not be allowed to register for a receivership, uh, an online receivership auction at the EJ Billig website. I know they have their own auctions that they conduct um, online and they have a way to register, but you will not be allowed to um, register for receivership auctions there. Once you've registered with us um, and approved, AJ Billig will send you an email with a login and password and instructional information. 
on how to use the bidding platform within five business days of the approval to bid or before the date the bidding opens. Um, some of the option details. Um, uh, like I said, every two months we're going to try for that, but because of the court um, issues, um, getting appointments in and um, just the nature of, you know, when we're getting uh, properties in, we may make those every month. We're still trying to figure out what to do for next year. It all really depends on um, how many properties we can get through. Normally, we auction off out on one day 30 or 50 properties, but um, we've done, you know, 25 at a time. We'll split it over two days um, and uh, over a two-day online um, auction. So, um, again, things are kind of fluid and we're kind of going with the flow depending on the number of properties we're able to get out of um, for it. Um, bidding starts at 5,000. That's a minimum. All properties are sold as is and uh, the deposit is 3,000 um, minimum or 10% of the sales price. Buyers will leave with a contract of sale. Um, again, in normal times, you, we have the option and once um, the auction has concluded, then you sign the contract and, and um, place your deposit uh, at that day. But since we're doing everything online, you have to, um, you will, once you, if you win a bid, then you will, you have until the next day to sign a contract in person at the offices of AJ Billig and also um, place your deposit, your full deposit then. Um, all purchases are subject to the existing VBN and any property um, that failed to sell at an auction will be placed on our website as an immediate sale. So if you go to our website right now, you'll see um, a list of properties that are available um, for um, immediate sale. You still have to be a pre-qualified bidder with one house at a time um, in order to purchase the immediate sale properties. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, um, auction day. Auction day is a little bit different. Um, when you see a date, <laughs> publicized auction date, um, at AJ Billig, you will see that's actually the bid closing day. So, Katie, can we go back to that um, sure. picture so I can and show folks um, kind of what it looks like? So, what you will see is um, the advertised date, uh, like I said, is the bid closing date. The bidding for properties will actually open about two to three days before. Um, so, our next auction, which we will we will send out info, uh, will be December 16th. That's a Wednesday. So that bidding will open the Friday before. Um, and so you will have that time, several days to, you know, look at property or um, set up your account to you know, with your, whatever your bidding limits are. And then on the um, the day um, on the advertised date, closing date. Um, you will see each property will have a time, a closing time. So you see here what I highlighted um, in this image, you know, 11.05, and then the next closing time is, 11, is five minutes later. So keep that in mind when you're bidding um, that there are, each property will have um, different closing times. Another thing too, that's important to, um, can we go back to that that's screen? Right. <laughs> okay. And I think too, that's important for um, bidding is that if you, during the last six, this is important because I think we've had a couple of people gotten confused over this, but the last 60 seconds before a bid closes, if you're the top bidder and then the last 60 seconds, another bid goes through, the software will automatically add another 60 seconds. So it's not like an eBay, like last minute, you know, last second, like bid and you win, it'll automatically extend. So um, that that's in the fine print, but make sure that you're aware of that. If you win a, um, if you win an auction, you will be contacted by email or by phone call by a representative of AG Billy to let you know what time to come into their office to sign contracts in person and um, drop off your deposit. Um, if you fail to sign, 
to show up and we've actually had that happen now that we're online, unfortunately, um, you will be prohibited from participating in receivership auctions for three years. So we've never actually had anybody skip out on contracts before when we would have it. Um, actually, no, we've had one um, when we'd had it, have it um, at, the, at the hotel. But since we're online, it's kind of, you know, we're seeing a lot more of that, unfortunately. So um, just keep in mind, if you are bidding, um, you're in a different state and you're bidding, make sure you let us know who is, who is going to sign for you in person. At um, uh, the next day. Okay. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, okay. This is very important. One house at a time never takes title. So we are um, off, we are appointed by the court to transfer property, but we never take title to that property. So um, that's important to note. Um, after an auction, we report all the sales to the court and we work to clear liens and um, the court will move forward to ratify um, the sale. Once we receive ratification, we'll contact you and your title company to um, and forward the doc any documents so they can order lien search and you can begin the title search and begin the process towards settlement. So this is where communication is really important because we, you know, time is of the essence. You, know, you only have certain amount of time to complete um, to get a UNO. And so, you know, we really, we wait. And as soon as we get that ratification, we want to keep moving forward and make sure that you um, reschedule settlement as quickly as possible. If you fail to settle on the property through no fault of one house or the city, um, you will, um, we will retain the deposit and you will be prohibited from participating in receivership uh, and auctions for one year for each property um, that is in breach of contract. Um, and again, you must obtain UNO within the year. Um, next slide. Okay, expectations of buyer after receivership option. Um, I just said, I mentioned before, or actually, Katie, I don't know if you have anything to add on your end um, from the city's end. Sure. It's something to, to consider and something to be aware of. Um, we have people who might buy one, two, or three properties, and they might wait until they get all three properties to start their permit application. Communication is key. Letting the inspector know, pulling those permits. If there's trouble or if there's issues, if you have, if you're trying to do historic property tax credits, we know that sometimes one year might not be feasible. In other instances, we have people that are able to take two story row houses and turn them over in four months, right? So we know sometimes each one is unique and different, but know that when you take title, you take title subject to that vacant building notice. The moment that your deed is recorded, you as the new owner get a vacant building notice. That means you are now on the radar for the city's property maintenance inspectors. They're going to go out. And if you don't pull permits in a short period of time, you're going to get a $900 citation. If you do not renovate in a timely manner, you could find yourself a defendant in a vacant building receiver action. Right? So, so this is... The, again, I think Pia said this a couple times. When you have purchased property at an auction from OHAT, you've got to stay in contact with them. Once you take title, you've got to stay in contact with the property maintenance inspector and with the attorney for that area. If it gets to that point, if you're having trouble renovating the property within the 12 month period, we're reasonable human beings. We get it. But if you haven't pulled permits within the first six months that you've owned this property, that's a problem for us. Right. Right. Thanks, Katie. And, sure. um, and you know, we, we have also bidders who rely on um, public financing as well. You know, grants, um, there's some state grants out there, some city grants um, out there um, for rehab. So we totally understand that those things take time. Um, you, your financing might be taking uh, a while, but again, we are reasonable human beings. We know how development, um, what happens, um, you know, any anything could happen. But if you communicate with us and let us know what's going on, um, 
you know, we'd be a lot more forgiving. Um, but if we have to chase you and try to find you, um, you're not going to get on our good side. So then we're going to be really annoyed. So, um, but yes, communication is important. Um, you know, what we like is when, as after an auction, when the winning bidder contacts us, you know, immediately and says, this is my title company and um, this is my, this, you can contact me here. That's great. So we already have that. Um, but that's, those are the things that um, give us um, some comfort knowing that um, you're on top of it. Um, next slide. Okay. Again, time frame for rehab. Again, you know, COVID rules apply. Um, things can um, can change. Um, but basically, you're looking at um, 90 days in between when court appoints a receiver and when we auction the property. 60 days from sale to ratification. Um, now, once you're ratified, once the sale's ratified, then we have 30 days to um, settlement. But that's if we can get clear title and we can talk about when um, when we run into issues like the um, proceeds of the sale is not enough to cover um, liens. So when that happens, um, then we'd have to submit a request to the city to remove liens and that could take time. Um, right. Just I'm going to chime in a little bit here. We had some issues in 2019, 2018 and 2019 with lien removal. Um, some was related to the ransomware attack. Others, we had some delays and issues. Um, hopefully we're behind that. Um, now the, our goal is always if liens have to be released on properties and the bulk of the properties that are coming through receivership need lien releases from the city. They've got monster tax bills. They've got monster water bills. They've got all kinds of citations and all of these other things that the cost at the auction is just not going to cover. Um, we go through a lien abatement process and there are, you know, a ton of people within the city that have to sign off on it. For a while, we were good. We were getting those things turned around within 45 days. Um, then we ran into some hiccups. Um, hopefully we're back on track and we're able to turn those lien releases around um, within 45 to should be no more than 60 days. Right. So that could um, be a delay to your settlement as well. Right. And other delays um, could be, you know, if a someone with an ownership interest in the property files an exception to the sale, you know, keep in mind, you know, they, they're still the owner and we are transferring the property on their behalf. So if there's any kind of, um, um, you know, issue with someone um, who wants to, who wants to file who objects to the sale or objects to the accounting or the proceeds or whatever that could delay um, the the sale and because um, that's that's a whole another that's going back to court there's hearings and things like that so just keeping keeping that in mind but ideally it's 30 days um, to settle after ratification if there are no liens to remove and the title is clear. And then um, from there, it's um, 180 days to you to you know. So sounds reasonable. <laughs> so uh, next slide. Okay, other outcomes. Um, so some outcomes of receivership uh, is um, that um, we will get. Sometimes we will have a. A bidder apply to be a um, to be a quali pre qualified bidder, and because of the application, um, we require them to disclose other properties, and then we do the research, and we'll often not often, but we will sometimes find other properties that are um, that that, are, that they own problem properties. So we would almost kind of push them to be in compliance with those other properties and obey those nuisances in order for them to be a qualified bidder with us. So that's kind of, we see that as a positive. So we kind of compel other bidders to um, fix their house before um, they, they become qualified with us. Um, owners consent to receivership, some with a uh, stay of the receivership, the receiver's action to enable them to to rehab. So this is kind of like the Katie or one. Right. Of so this quotes. this this is this happens a lot 
where an owner comes in and says, I want to rehabilitate the property. So what we end up negotiating with the owners is what we call a consent agreement with the stay. So one house at a time is appointed the vacant building receiver, but their actions to auction the property are stayed sometimes six months, nine months, 12 months. And there are milestones in there that the owner has to achieve. If the owner fails to achieve those, then one house at a time can move forward with the auction. So like I said, just because even just because there's an appointment, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to end up in the auction. Sometimes the appointments allow the owner to try to renovate the property. And if the owner does, then it never gets to auction. The, the order is dismissed because the use and occupancy has been obtained. If the use and occupancy is not obtained, it's a delay for one house to auction the property because of the terms of the order. That makes sense. Right. Um, another thing is other outcomes is that um, the creation of comps for uh, these sales. So we have, um, you know, although we, we always say it's more receivership is successful when we um, put in properties where there's it's, there's a market for it. It's an area with some kind of market, but we do have properties that are in an area where um, we're trying to establish a market. There's nothing else there. So having um, being able to sell properties at um, an auction establishes a sales, um, some kind of comp in that area um, for uh, to help stabilize that um, that neighborhood. Um, okay, next slide. I think this is the my last slide. Is unanticipated issues. Um, the large number of dead people, that's your words, Katie, yeah. uh, being titled to vacant properties. Um, so I believe in, in this case, and Katie, go ahead and chime in here, is that right. a lot of these properties are um, owned by dead people, then the city would have to open a probate. Um, right. And that adds, that can add four months to the filing of a receivership action or getting an outcome. So for example, if someone is deceased and they own property, we have to go to circuit court, to probate court. We have to ask for judicial probate. We have to get um, a judicial probate personal representative to stand in to accept service. So all of those things can delay um, getting the one, getting the receivership order and going forward. Um, and then like he was talking, we talked about this a little bit kind of in the last slide, is that the auction sale is less than the government liens on the property. Um, so that's going to cause delay for settlement, right? Because it has to go through a lien release process in order for the property to sell. Um, and we actually talked about this next one too, right? The successful bidder becomes another receivership candidate due to failure to rehabilitate. Um, this happens. It doesn't it's not chronic, it's not 50%, but it happens enough that it's bothersome that when someone buys something at receivership and they fail to renovate it, we will go ahead and file a receivership against the purchaser that bought it from OHAD. Right, and if that happens in case, it is rare, there's not, there aren't, that doesn't happen frequently, but if you have a property that, um, you purchase through us and you fail to rehab and the city has to re-receiver it, then you are automatically pretty much banned. There's no such thing as permanent ban, but you are banned from um, participating in the receivership program. That's that's kind of a huge, it's a huge no-no on our end. Um, so, um, and going back on, let's see. I think we covered lien removal. Oh, another thing I wanted to add as far as an anticipated issues is um, some coming across this more is that some properties will have an open um, tax sale uh, case in circuit court, which is a different court than district court. So we've been running into those issues um, once we get to settlement or once we start doing a lien search or title search that we'll see that the receivership action has moved forward sold everything went through, but there's this open circuit court case uh, related to a tax sale or a bankruptcy. And in those situations, you know, that could delay it or it could even kind of throw the wholesale um, out right. the window. Right. Um, side note on the tax sale issue, we 
always when we know about the tax sale, um, we name the tax sale purchasers in our receivership action. What happens is tax sale purchasers then quickly try to file their foreclosure to try to get as much money out of a $5,000 property as they can. Um, so it does create a little bit of a cloud on title. So sometimes we have some back end work to do because you will not get title insurance unless we can resolve that tax sale issue. Even though we've sued them and we believe we've done everything right under the statute, we still have to address open, cir open circuit court cases. This does not happen all the time, um, but just like the issues and delays that are happening in district court, we have issues and delays that are happening in circuit court. So it's taking longer to resolve those issues than it used to um, just because of where we are in COVID times with the court. But it doesn't just because it's there doesn't mean it won't settle. It just might take a little additional time. Right, right. So um, again, just so going to um, the last sentence here, every property is unique and everyone takes a different path to a UNO. And that's so true with uh, these receivership properties because um, you think it would, it's going smoothly, but then you run into um, title issues with certain liens or um, even a title company, each, every title company and um, will have different um, standards or, or rules of what they're okay with. So we've run into those situations as well. But, you know, we work, um, we will work with you and your title company and to make sure that, you know, we get you clear, um, clear and marketable um, title. Um, and that, because that's, that's the goal of the receivership program is that we give you clean title and, um, and it just takes some time um, to do that sometimes, but, you know, we, again, we're reasonable and we can work with you on that. Um, anything else, Katie? No, I just kind of went to these, these top 10 here at the back. Um, the pointers that I want you guys to remember from, from what both P and I have said is that it's a nuisance abatement tool. So what that means is it's not a government taking. So if someone says the city's trying to take my house for receivership, that's not what it is. The city's trying to get a use and occupancy and get rid of that vacant building notice. Um, it's fairly quick to remedy a nuisance all things considered when we consider other tools. But remember, it's a nuisance abatement tool. It's That's what it is at its core. So if you're used to buying, say, city properties, if you're used to responding to an RFA, if you're used to trying to like bid on this package and being the winning bidder based on certain criteria, that doesn't happen with receivership. It's strictly a dollars thing and your ability to abate a nuisance. You have to be the winning bidder and have the ability to abate the nuisance. At the end of the day, for us, use and occupancies bring communities together, improves value. Um, it actually moves quickly to the from the current owner through OHAT to the person that's going to renovate. Um, we can target blocks, we can look at different types of property. It frees up municipal liens. Most of these properties would never sell because of the municipal liens. Without the lien release program, these vacants would just be stuck, um, which is one of the reasons why receivership is such a good tool. So it's not only city liens, but it's ex tax liens, it's mortgages, properties that are upside down. Um, you know, we try to work together with the private sector. We try to be work together with communities. We try to work together with neighbors to get really good outcomes for everybody. And, um, and again, dead people are a problem. So that owning the property and it does assist in transferring those owned by dead people. Um, here's the websites again, dhcdbaltimorecity.gov. Code map is you can, don't even worry about this big old long one. Go to DHCD's website and right on the front page, there's a link to interactive mapping. It'll take you right where you want to go. Um, One House's website, you can look at properties that are coming up for auction, ones that are for immediate sale, and you can you can submit your look at pull your bidder application down and look at that criteria. And here is contact information for myself and for Pia and for One House. And that's pretty much our presentation. Pia, you have anything else you want to throw in there? Um, just a quick thing. If you um, want to know about the next auction, which is coming up December 16th, and you um, you should sign up on our website um, to be on our email list. We should be publishing the, 
the list, uh, the preview list tomorrow. Um, also, that our uh, the bidder application would be due December 9th. So just to keep those dates in mind. All right. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Pia, for the uh, presentation. At this time, uh, we'll have questions that were in the chat that are in the chat from uh, Kelly. Kelly, are you um, ready? Is um, Kelly, Kelly muted? Let me, I'm checking now. Um, screen change. Secondly. Under Danielle. I'm trying to get in now. All right, Kelly. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, the first question is, what is necessary for a building to get a VBN? All right. So vacant building notice is defined in the building code. And what it means is that it's a property that's unfit for human habitation. Criteria could mean that it's open to casual entry that it has no windows and doors, that it has boarded windows and doors. So it has to be something that's unfit for human habitation. There's something else called a nuisance vacant. There's two types. Like I said, the one that when you look at it, it's boarded, it's open to casual entry, it gets a vacant building notice. The other one, it's unoccupied. It's got a series of exterior violations or a number of outstanding citations. After a period of time, if it's clear that no one is taking care of this property, it might be able to get a vacant building notice. If you go to the code map, you'll see these little squares, try these little squares on properties, and they will identify the ones that already have existing vacant building notices. Great, thanks. Um, is there any mechanism to force a sale when a property does not have a vacant building notice? No. The only way receivership can happen is with a vacant building notice on the structure. Because remember, it's a nuisance abatement. And so the nuisance happens the moment that the vacant building notice is issued. Great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. After the auction, are you the responsible owner for the property until the transfer takes place? No. The property is still legally owned by the prior owner. So technically, it is still that owner's responsibility. Now, with that said, the owners never take responsibility. So if the property is open to casual entry, um, the city will go back out and board it. If it has, like, you know, Pia will tell us, she'll send me an email and say, we have a report that there are squatters in 123 Main Street. Uh, we know it has an order that the receiver is the person who's in control to sell it. So we will go ahead, post an order to vacate, make sure that the property is empty, and we'll continue to board it. So technically, the old owner is still responsible, but the city will take action to at least keep it boarded and keep people out of it until the property transfers. I will add, though, to that, um, that in the receivership contract of sale, it does say that, that um, once you sign the contract, then you um, take physical possession of the property. So that means that as a, uh, if even if you're under contract, you can go to the property and uh, put your own locks there. Um, but that, or, you know, board it up or, um, you know, use your own methods to secure. Um, but that would be at your own cost. So say, uh, because that property hasn't settled yet, if it's for some reason it fails to settle, then that would be your own cost. It won't be reimbursed for anything that you um, spend on that property. So um, we've had, you know, buyers who are experienced and they will put their own lots in there as soon as the auction is done. And then they'll put a sign, you know, private property or whatever they need to do. But you are allowed to do that under the uh, contract of sale. Uh, the next question is, um, would the city permit private attorneys to help with capacity limitations and receivership filings? No, legally we cannot have private attorneys file receiverships because it is a police power that's delegated to the jurisdiction. Only the jurisdiction can file the receivership actions. Um, how does one ensure that they can be on the list to be contacted for bids on a property? 
Um, so can you repeat that? How does um, I think it's uh, how would anyone make sure that they are on the list for um, getting information about upcoming auctions and what properties will be on that list? Sure, um, you, can, um, you can sign up on our website. Um, we don't send a lot of emails out. To, so when we send them out, it's usually to announce um, to, to um, publicize a list of preview uh, addresses and also to publicize the auction. So you can sign up on our website for that. Um, we, like I said, we also we try to do this every two months, um, maybe more frequently, depending on um, you know how how uh, we do the online um, auctions. Um, and so it will be on that there on our website posted, and it will also be on our on our AV billings um, site. Great. Um, how does OHAT ensure that buyers finish the property within a year? I think you kind of answered that one a little bit. But like yeah, I think well, we, we actually work together. Um, so remember, OHAT is not an agent of the city in any way. They are a court appointed receiver. And in the contract, it says you must renovate within 12 months. But the reality is, is the city that makes that that happen, right? So once they take title, if they fail to renovate and they fail to give a um, a actual real reason as to why it hasn't happened, then we would refile. But that's kind of, it's, it's one of these things where we work together. One house lets us know what's going on. We let them know what's going on. And then we make that determination to move forward. Um, so for First time rehabbers that are working with experienced companies and or contractors, is there a process to purchase from OHAT? Um, we've definitely had that before. Um, you so normally it, we would um, you'd have to either get a letter, we'll accept a letter that you are partnering with this entity. Um, you know, especially we've had this where um, we work with nonprofits who are not in you know, who are uh, have a partner who provides either the financial support or the capacity support. So we'll accept the letter um, from the um, from you know a, an experienced company or contractor. Um, but it, it's usually something you know we'll we'll look at in a case by case. We'll we'll, we'll see. Um, but you you know, go ahead and apply. And if you have a partner that you want to work with, we'll take a look at their. Um, experience as well so but feel free to just you know we can discuss that you know on a case by case okay uh who determines whether a neighborhood is considered a quote unquote strong neighborhood for purposes of streamlined code enforcement how do you define strong neighborhoods for purposes sure. it's actually the city every i think it's every three years there's a market analysis done of every single neighborhood every single street and every single property and you can actually see that on code map. So it's it's market and data driven. It's not that me, Katie Byrne, goes out there and goes, wow, what a really cute neighborhood. I think we're in a receivership here, right? It's not that at all. It's a decision that's made at a higher level based off of actual market analysis and detail. So like we might may have an entire neighborhood that's super strong, or we may have pockets of a neighborhood that are strong and pockets of a neighborhood that are weak. Like I said, we have this data and it's done, I think the last time, I want to say it was either 2017 or 2018 was the last time that it was done. And the, the information is actually available on ODMAP. So it's based off of real-time market data analysis. Great. Um, okay, I think this is the last question that I have. Um, for properties that are in receivership but are not worth five thousand um, dollars, they ask who sets the limit. But could you also explain a little bit, I guess, about um, when properties, the sale of properties, when they aren't sold at the auction? Sure. Um, so the, the five thousand limit is um, actually is the fee that is OHAT's fee. We are ma we are capped at five thousand for property. So we've set the auction minimum to that amount. Obviously, you know, some properties will not sell for 5,000 um, at auctions and that's what's happened. Um, usually we have about, you know, maybe 5,000 properties at an auction, not sell for that minimum. When that happens, it goes to our immediate sale portfolio on our website. And most of those properties, they will sit there until somebody, sees it and decides to make an offer 
Um, but most of the time, um, those properties will sell, um, won't go to the side. Um, yeah, just. I'm going to chime in a little bit here. We try not to receiver properties that will put the receiver out of business, right? So when PF says $5,000 is the minimum bid, that's their out of pocket cost. Remember, they are a nonprofit, right? This is what the, it's that cost is what keeps their doors open. Um, so there's a reason why we don't file receiverships on every vacant building in the city, right? Because some of them have a negative value. I mean, that's, that's hard to hear. Most people think real property has value, but a lot have a negative value. And we will not put those in a receivership auction because every time the receiver auctions a property, it costs them money, right? So yeah, there are- Just to, yeah. Go ahead. Just to um, let, you know, just- to let everyone know that um, even though our, our fee is capped at 5,000, we average about 2,300 per property on our fees because there is a cost to um, putting um, properties to auction. You know, there's, you know, there's the auctioneer's fees, there's legal fees and, um, and other things that come up. So, um, however, that doesn't mean that we won't, we'll refuse properties. We don't ever refuse properties because they're in a low market area or we feel that, oh, that's just, it's not worth that much. That's not our goal here. Our goal is to transfer properties to uh, qualified bidders to be at that nuisance. So we're not going to refuse uh, a property because we feel that it's, it's not going to garner enough, um, uh, you know, uh, interest. However, I will say, though, that um, it really, you know, it's really hard to um, say that, oh, that property isn't worth, not worth that much, because I would think that, but then I would have an online, especially in the online auctions, and I'm really surprised at what people will pay um, for a property. And really, the property is really worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So, um, you know, for, so for us to make that judgment call, it's actually not really on us to make a judgment call, it's really for whoever is interested and um, whoever is willing to um, pay for that. Hope that answered that question. Yeah, and Katie, could you just answer quickly? Um, sure. Someone was asking if they were referring, if you're referring to the yeah, typology. Yeah, I saw that. It is. It's the housing typology map. That's that is the base layer for data that we make a determination as to whether something is streamlined code enforcement or not. Like where we believe on its own that it could happen um, without identifying a buyer ahead of time in a more distressed market. Right. And and we also make certain judgment calls on our own based on sale, based on inspector data, based on community input as well. Um, so so we use that housing typology generally drives most of it, but we also talk to community, we look at recent sales um, to make certain decisions as well. Okay, great. And um just want to remind everyone that uh, in the next 48 hours, uh, in 48 hours, we'll have this presentation. It's being recorded, so we'll have it up on our website um, within the next 48 hours. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Um, also, all of those um, attendees who are interested in receivership. Uh, please read uh, and navigate to uh, as part of our um, responsibility. Howard, we lost you. Uh, no other question, Kelly, in the um, Howard, we couldn't hear you. Oh. You were skipping. Oh, okay. Yeah, Is we need better? to repeat it because you was going in and out. Okay. It's a little better.
attendees is who are um, again interested in receiver or office happy to assist you in playing a special thanks to with our uh, DHCD communication thanks a lot Kevin for all your help um is Kate still on Kate Edwards okay if there are no further questions I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out their busy day um thank you for your participation and um this concludes uh the workshop for the receivership process thanks a lot everyone have a great evening stay safe thank, thank you. you thank you all thank you have a good evening thanks, thanks katie and pia thank you thank you so much